Please join me in welcoming to the Distinctive Voices podium, Dr. Monroe Cullum. Thank you for that nice introduction. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? If not too loud. Um, it's really an honor to be here, and I, I want to thank the organizers uh, and, uh, for uh, inviting me to, uh, to be here this evening, and I'd like to thank you all for taking time out of your uh, busy schedules and lives uh, to, to join us this evening. I hope there's uh, going to be a little something for everyone. I see we have uh, an impressively diverse audience here, uh, so I, I do hope uh, that each of you uh, uh, has some takeaway messages, although I will say at the outset, uh, I will probably uh, leave you with more questions uh, than I will uh, provide you answers for, because there's a lot that we don't know uh, in this area. So my uh, research is, is in two primary areas, uh, and one is in uh, aging uh, and disorders of aging, cognitive aging, Alzheimer's disease uh, and related dementias, and also in traumatic brain injury. So I, uh, at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, which is in Dallas, Texas, uh, you notice my heavy Texas accent, you probably picked up on that right away. Um, good, that was a joke. That's the first, the first test of the night. There will be more, so. Anyway, uh, so uh, there aren't too many groups uh, that are actually combining research in both areas. My talk tonight is divided up into several uh, sections, actually. So we're gonna, we are going to review a little bit about uh, definition terms, uh, some brief statistics, and uh, common symptoms of concussion. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about methods of evaluation. Uh, but then the, the second half is really going to be on traumatic brain injury. Uh, you'll see the term TBI, traumatic brain injury, uh, which is equivalent to concussion, basically. A concussion is a mild traumatic brain injury. And then we'll talk about conclusions and then some uh, future directions. Uh, I, I may uh, try to dispel some myths that are out there also, uh, but let's get started. So of course, everybody in this day and age knows that a concussion is a brain injury. Uh, it's becoming very, very popularized all over the place. Um, I, I do wanna do uh, a special note uh, to the, uh, the uh, Centers for Disease Control. The CDC has a wonderful website uh, for you parents, student athletes, and relatives and friends of athletes and others who are uh, susceptible or have had a concussion, uh, the CDC has some wonderful information uh, documents that you can download and, and use uh, at home and in your settings. So right now, sports concussion is a very, very hot topic, uh, as, as most of, if not all of you know. Um, all of the major uh, sports uh, and the major networks have something about concussion pretty much on, on a daily basis. Uh, every year, something new comes out. There's something always going on. It's affecting uh, career decisions in, in, in young people. It's raising concerns uh, for some of our uh, uh, more senior players involved. And, and there's been some, some heated uh, messages and exchanges uh, occurring over the years. Recently, we have a report of uh, uh, presumably concussion-related illness in, in Frank Gifford. Got President Obama talking about, uh, you know, he wouldn't let, it, he's not sure if he would let his sons play football if he had sons. And of course, the upcoming uh, movie, uh, which I, I'm going to say is probably maybe a little bit hyped. Uh, just guessing, just guessing. I heard there's even a car chase in it, which I, I never thought that the research in my area of neuropsychology would even be remotely associated with the title of a major motion picture or have a, a movie star starring in it, but uh, it'll be interesting to see. Um, so uh, the NFL often takes a, a bad rap in some of these situations, uh, but actually they have uh, been showing a nice decline in concussions over the past few years. In fact, uh, once they moved up the kickoff line to the 35 uh, just last year, concussions this year are down 35 to 40%. So uh, they're really making some nice uh, headway o over time. The other thing we have to keep in mind is that the number of concussions in the NFL are, it's a pretty small number relative to other activities and events. Uh, we've got thousands, uh, millions of uh, head injuries going on each year. The CDC estimates about 3.8 million per year in different activities. And as I mentioned, while, while football gets kind of a, a bad rap or is often at the top of the list, it's actually not the number one cause of concussions. Bicycling in all of its forms is actually number one. If you think about kids on bikes when they're little, uh, older folks on bikes, mountain bikers, you know, all, it just goes on and on. 
this, so this is an order uh, of decreasing frequency. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm happy or sad to say my son has done just about everything on the list, uh, as I'm sure many of you can relate to. Uh, and we can talk about uh, that and, and what we let our kids do uh, later on, too. So uh, as I mentioned, there are uh, almost 4 million a year. The vast majority are mild injuries, uh, sports and recreation. Uh, actually, uh, injuries result in some deaths every year as well, and we can talk about that, uh, that too. So uh, the facts from the CDC, uh, concussion is a brain injury. Uh, they're all serious. They should be taken seriously. Uh, most of them occur without loss of consciousness. Now, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a common public myth, if you will, that you have to be knocked out. If I'm not knocked out, I didn't have a concussion. It's not true. Um, and actually, if you have repeated concussions in cases of brain swelling, uh, if repeated concussions over a short amount of time, we think actually may be uh, 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 life-threatening, in fact. Uh, that's why all 50 states now have... Uh, concussion laws uh, that require removal of uh, at least high school uh, and younger athletes from competitive play when a concussion is suspected uh, until they're medically cleared, which is something that the, the NFL went around to all the uh, states and helped uh, us pass those concussion legislation laws. I see California's was passed the same year as Texas in, in 2011. So we're going to do a little brief review of neuroanatomy before we get into this. So the human brain weighs about three pounds. Uh, it's like thick jello uh, sitting in the skull. It uses about 20% of the body's oxygen supply at any one time, though. It's got extensive vascular system with really, really tiny little uh, arteries and veins throughout it. It is protected by the skull, of course. So you've got skin, you've got the skull. Then you've got outer linings outside the brain called the meninges, for those of you who are actively involved in anatomy courses now, or those of you that remember these things from school perhaps a few more years ago. Um, and then the, bain, the uh, brain is also bathed in cerebral spinal fluid. So it's kind of floating in this fluid uh, with a little bit of space around it and then some protective coverings around that. So it's not as vulnerable as, as one might think, uh, although it's, it certainly is vulnerable. Estimates currently right now that we've got about 100 billion neurons, uh, you know, miles and miles of uh, myelinated fibers. That's uh, fibers of the brain that are covered with fat that help speed and make uh, nerve impulses quicker. Uh, and it's estimated there are about a quadrillion, which is one of those numbers I can't fathom. It's like, how far is it to the moon? I, my mind just doesn't, I just don't get it. It's, it's a big number. How much money does Bill Gates have? It's a big number. Uh, suffice to say, there are even more uh, neurons and, uh, and the connections. So the, the brain is full of, uh, of these labyrinthine uh, connections uh, of the cellular processes. And some are very, very fine uh, as they protrude uh, and uh, uh, extend from cell bodies and uh, link up with other cells. So what is a concussion? Uh, a very simple definition is a traumatically induced transient disturbance of brain function. So in the old days, the football players would say, you got your bell rung. You're not quite thinking right. That's the most uh, simple definition. As I mentioned earlier, a loss of consciousness, or LOC, is not necessary for a diagnosis, although it makes the diagnosis a lot easier. If your patient is lying there and they're out after a hit, you know they've had a concussion, uh, unless it was a coincidental uh, loss of consciousness, which is very unlikely. Um, and here are some of the more common symptoms uh, of concussion. Um, and the symptoms may be very subtle at times, which is why it's so important that we get a report from the individual about what their symptoms are. Uh, and I'll come back to that in a little while as well. So the general domains of cognitive symptoms, uh, I'm sorry, of concussion symptoms uh, include cognitive symptoms. By that I mean attention, concentration, memory, reasoning abilities, your thinking uh, skills, thinking speed. Physical symptoms like headache or balance or visual problems, uh, mood, irritability, depression, anxiety, those symptoms can occur. And then some sort of disturbed sleep, whether it's I can't fall asleep or I keep waking up, I can't sleep through the night anymore, or I'm just not sleeping much at all. So those are the general uh, concussion domains, although you'll hear me say a couple times that uh, no two concussions are alike, and that's, and that's why they can be difficult uh, to identify and diagnose initially. Uh, and sometimes uh, tough to treat. If you look at the uh, 
a large analysis of the literature of neuropsychological functioning of following concussion. Uh, at, at about 24 hours afterward, delayed recall, uh, delayed memory. So if I give you a list of words now and I ask you what those words were five minutes from now, that's delayed recall. That uh, function is often affected, as is new learning, uh, and processing speed is often slowed too. And that's a common complaint. I don't know how, how many in the audience, and I, I never ask this question, so uh, I, I don't know how many have had concussions or known somebody with a concussion, but it's probably a high percentage. And a lot of patients just say, I just, I feel foggy, I feel slowed down. They can still get everything done they need to, but they're just not firing on all eight cylinders, assuming an eight cylinder vehicle. Um, that's an old term, you kids don't understand. Four <laughs> cylinders, okay. two, uh, you know, anyway. So uh, after about a week though, uh, if you look at the literature across large samples of uh, research subjects, there aren't uh, detectable abnormalities in a majority of cases. Uh, although a few showed some uh, slightly decreased uh, verbal memory scores. Now, these are large group studies, though. So the vast majority of people who sustain a concussion are going to recover uh, usually within uh, uh, several days to, to a week. I mentioned earlier that no two are alike. Uh, the majority do recover in roughly a, a week. Now, the uh, caveats to that are if you've had a concussion previously, your subsequent ones may uh, result in longer time to recover. Um, if you are younger, you may take longer to recover. So a, uh, the brain of an eight-year-old might take a month to get back to normal, whereas a 25-year-old might be fine in a couple of days. So there do seem to be some, some age effects. Um, there's a, a group that uh, shows recovery over a few weeks. Then there is a small minority that are, that are considered complicated concussions that still remain symptomatic of some sort um, perhaps over months in duration. Uh, and I've seen a number of patients uh, like this, and it, it is a minority, but it's a, it's a, it's a real, um, it's a significant issue for those, those affected. And we're gonna talk about some treatment strategies if we have time uh, at the end, or if that comes up in questions. See, concussion is such a huge topic, uh, it's impossible to cover uh, every, everything in one presentation. We can make a, a lecture out of each one of these. So the later symptoms uh, that may be uh, ongoing that people may uh, experience include, uh, I mentioned feeling foggy, short-term memory problem, uh, fatigue, sleep disturbance, maybe some depression. This one's really important here, decreased frustration tolerance and irritability, which you'll see my footnote. You've gotta be able to distinguish that from other conditions such as being a teenager. <laughs> I do not mean any offense to the teenagers in the audience. I'm sure you're exceptions to the rule and cause your parents no problems whatsoever. Uh, in the absence of a concussion, right? Um, but uh, these are just some of the more common symptoms, uh, but they do run quite a gamut. So let's review what happens to the brain in a concussion. So you actually don't have to hit your head to have a concussion. You see some of the hits in the, in the NFL, if somebody gets a really big hit to the chest and the, and the head is violently whipped back and forth like in a whiplash uh, style or if there's a rotational injury, uh, that can produce uh, concussion, concussion symptoms as well. So a concussion can result from a contusion or an actual bru direct bruise of the brain. So if uh, this person here, you see the brain is contacting the skull right here. And then I mentioned earlier, the brain is like thick jello. So it, it, it's, it's elastic. So once it hits here, if the force is hard enough, it's actually gonna bounce back and then hit at the backside too. You've probably all heard of the coup contra coup type of injury uh, that can happen at least in more uh, uh, higher impact injuries. So what happens within the brain are what we call shear and strain effects. Uh, I'll, I'll show you some pictures of, of some uh, uh, brain cells and their connections in a, in a moment. But basically, as the front part of the brain is going forward, it's moving at a little bit faster uh, pace than the back part of the brain to catch up. And then it bounces back, and there's a little bit of a delay. There's also differences in the density of brain tissue. Uh, so th th there are denser areas and more, uh, more uh, fluid content areas, and they move at different rates. So you can get these stretching and, and, and tearing effects. 
And in addition to that, you, we get what is, a, what is called a metabolic cascade of abnormal cellular response. Uh, we won't get into the neuroscience of it uh, tonight, but suffice to say, the, the brain basically ends up in, in a bit of an energy crisis. Uh, it's starved for energy momentarily or within minutes to hours after a, a concussion. And at that time where it's starved for energy, it's not producing as much energy. So it's kind of a double whammy. Actually, uh, David Hovde at UCLA has done some of the seminal work in that area. So there's a, a nice uh, 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 web link uh, on YouTube you can go to to actually watch it in motion. I didn't link on it tonight because basically it just shows it going back and forth and, and how things bounce around. Um, but the, so this is the, the, uh, the cortex. That's the big part of the brain. That's the, where thought, reasoning, most of our higher cognitive functions are. And you see it sort of sits atop what we call the, the midbrain area. And then there are connective tissues. Uh, this center uh, region here called the corpus callosum is, is white matter. That's connective tissue within the brain. So the, the, the overall brain sits on top of the brain stem. And when there's a violent shaking, it actually gets a little kind of rubbing force as well, uh, which can cause some particular damage to the central uh, regions. So this is a picture of a, a cell body and an axon, which is a, one of the connective fibers. You see the yellow myelin sheath that uh, helps with uh, rapid nerve conduction. So you can imagine if this, if this end is, getting, is going this way and this end is slower, it's going to stretch these. And these can actually become uh, torn or stretched to the point of, of dysfunction, maybe momentary or brief dysfunction, before they snap back and, and, and uh, resume a normal function. So I mentioned earlier you can have the direct physical effects of the brain actually hitting something in the skull, uh, the pathways. Uh, the cells may become uh, abnormally communicative. Some may be excited and <coughs> communicating more than they should. Others may be downregulated, uh, really causing kind of a, a non-focal storm within the brain. Sounds just awful, doesn't it? Uh, and no two concussions are alike. Like I say, if you're if your guy is, or your gal is knocked out on the field, it doesn't take a physician to say that's a concussion. Uh, this one was just a couple weeks ago in the NFL, and the announcer says, well, there's obviously a concussion. He threw, a, he threw an interception right after that. Well, what's the rate of interceptions? I mean, was he really concussed? I'm sure his head hurt. He did hit the turf pretty hard. Uh, in that case, actually, they did report he had some concussive symptoms. But just from watching it, you can't necessarily tell. Okay, so uh, how do we evaluate concussion? Well, it's a clinical examination done by an athletic trainer, uh, a healthcare professional, physician, neuropsychologist, other healthcare uh, individual with training in this area. Uh, using often post-concussion symptom checklists. Uh, there are standardized questions we use at sideline. Uh, there are the Maddox questions that coaches or uh, athletic trainers will ask in an athletic competition. Who are we playing? What's the score? Who did we play last week? Just to kind of look at general orientation. And then there actually are formal tests of uh, cognitive function as well. You, subtracting seven from 100, and you see how many times you can do that and how quickly. There's actually computerized cognitive screening that's now widely used in, a, in many, many high schools, colleges, and in, in the pros, which I'll talk about in, in a little bit. There's formal neuropsychological evaluation, which is basically more extensive assessment of cognitive skills. Uh, the patient may be seen by a neurologist. And then off, the question often comes up, should there be some sort of brain scan? Should you get a CAT scan or an MRI done? And of course, you can get an MRI done uh, just about anywhere nowadays. <laughs> This is not a doctored slide. I was, this is a small town in Texas, and I, I just I made my wife stop the car so I could take a picture. I guess you get your clothes washed, and you can get your brain scanned when the dryer turns off, I guess. Anyway, in the vast majority of cases, CT or MRI uh, is going to be negative in, in the vast majority of concussion cases. So that's really up to your health care provider in terms of making that call. If there are any focal uh, neurologic symptoms, like if one, one pupil is way bigger than the other, or if they're really uh, you know, uh, striking uh, symptoms of concern, uh, imaging might be requested. Uh, but in the va vast majority of cases, it's going to be normal, because our current modern neuroimaging techniques really don't show abnormality in, in most cases of concussion.
discussion. And this is where sports neuropsychology kind of comes in, uh, where we're involved in the baseline assessment. Uh, for those, those of you who are uh, active in sports at the high school or college or uh, beyond, uh, you often go in, in prior to an athletic competition season, you take a baseline cognitive test to see how you're doing. Uh, we're trying to get an assessment of your uninjured brain at its best. Um, and then if there's an injury, we repeat the test to compare you to your own baseline, which is, it's not infallible, it's not perfect, uh, but it's, it's better than nothing. Um, these are standardized protocols in the NFL and the NHL. They've been doing this uh, for, uh, gosh, uh, all, about 15 years, I guess now. Um, I'm the consultant for the Dallas Cowboys and Dallas uh, Stars, so I, uh, we see all of them uh, each year. Uh, to do a baseline assessment, and then if they're injured, we go out and, and evaluate them using the computer tests as well as more traditional neuropsychological testing as well. And I, I, I still hope to see the Dallas Stars doing that with the Stanley Cup again and hope to get more wins someday, but that's all I can say. So uh, neuropsychological testing, um, these are just standard tests, and I just wanted to show you some, uh, just a few examples to give you a sense of the types of tasks that we do. So we, you might be given a list of words or shown a list of uh, series of pictures, and you're asked to recall them at a later point in time. So some things you re may remember quite accurately, some things you just draw a blank, some things you might get in the, the right category. Uh, others are just missing, and some are just way off. Um, that's, that's how the retrieval process uh, goes, and, and we have standardized tests to measure this. Other tasks involve uh, connecting dots on a page as fast as you can. Um, again, it's nice to have a baseline so we can compare that to, but we have extensive normative data from healthy uninjured brains to look at too. Uh, tasks might be something like this, where you have to quickly look at the bottom one and then scan up to the top to see if that's, the, if that's a match or mismatch. Or every time you see a red circle on the left, press the space bar. But if you see a red circle on the right, don't. So you've got to inhibit that as well. So I mentioned that computerized cognitive screening uh, is uh, commonly used in sports applications. Um, it can be insensitive, though. They're not the toughest tests uh, that we have. And in terms of symptom reporting, um, there can be a problem with athletes either over-reporting or under-reporting symptoms. So athletes typically, especially at high levels, want to be in play. They want to be back out on the court, back on the field. Uh, so they may under-report symptoms. So it takes a good clinician to, to thoroughly assess them and, and weigh all the evidence. So that's, that's why it's a multidisciplinary assessment. You've got to look at the cognitive symptoms, the physical symptoms. Uh, you've got to watch and do some balance testing with the patient. Um, and, uh, and uh, encourage uh, honesty as much as possible. So there may be other factors uh, that come into play when interpreting these tests also. Uh, for example, effort at the time, if somebody's abnormally fatigued, uh, if they've got a coexisting, uh, pre-existing condition such as a learning disability, that's where the baseline testing can come in handy so that we know how you were before your injury. And also we, we even look at things like intellectual level uh, because well, I'll just let you read this quote. <laughs> that was from an uninjured, famous quarterback. I won't name the name. Um, so these sports-based uh, neuro neuropsychological examinations can play a variety of roles, both in terms of, a, of acute concussion, recovery, tracking over time. Uh, later on, we get into issues like, uh, when is it time to quit? Um, one of the questions I'm often asked are, how many concussions are too many? And of course, the answer to that is, how many for whom? What is your history? What's your, you know, uh, what's your background? What are other risk factors you might have? And uh, we'll, we'll get back to that a little bit later as well. So now I'm going to shift into the, to the aging brain uh, part of the talk, uh, and, then, and then we'll synthesize things uh, at the end. So in addition to the acute effects, uh, aging raises concerns for uh, the risk for cognitive decline y years later. Uh, so we know that normally um, our cognitive skills change with age. So you've got a nice increase. If I had a slide here, it, I quit showing the slide because it's depressing now that I'm over 50 because I'm on the downhill <laughs> slope now. Uh, but certain abilities stay intact uh, and even actually improve, uh, at least until well into the 70s. Uh, but things like reaction time starts to slow down. I mean, you can see this in, uh, in you know, watching athletes in their careers, you know, an, an aged NFL player, you know, at the upper 30s, right? And, uh, they're really old for that, uh, 
So uh, they may not be as quick as they used to be. The brain changes with age. Uh, we all experience cellular loss, and that actually starts in, uh, in about the mid to upper 20s. Uh, the brain is, isn't actually mature until about the mid 20s in guys and the early 20s in gals. Uh, women always have a, a maturational advantage on, on the guys. Sorry, guys, but that's the way it is. Although there are some extraordinarily mature young males out there, but I think the uh, less mature probably outnumber. Um, I'll leave it at that. You can discuss that amongst yourselves uh, at home tonight. Um, so age is the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the older you are, the risk goes up, at least to a certain point. Um, family history factors in a bit also in, in, in many cases. Um, it's been reported in the literature that a, that a serious traumatic brain injury, like we're talking, you know, coma for days uh, or at least, you know, more than a few hours, so has been associated with a two to fourfold increase in the chances of developing Alzheimer's disease later in life, although there's some mixed findings along those lines. There's also some overlap between the pathologies uh, involved in, in the acquired, an acquired disorder like traumatic brain injury and a neurodegenerative condition like Alzheimer's. So the question has arisen, is there a link between uh, Alzheimer's disease and more milder forms of uh, traumatic brain injury? Or what about repetitive traumatic brain injury? Which gets immediately into the concussion movie and the whole, all the, the, the talk and hype about chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I'm really not gonna talk too much about that tonight because that's, like I say, kind of a separate lecture, but I do have a few slides on it. First of all, this is not a new concept. It was uh, described originally in the 1920s as punch drunk sy syndrome. Y'all yeah, may remember that, uh, reported in uh, boxers primarily, which interestingly is a sport designed to inflict concussion, right? So, <laughs> yeah, in fact, uh, I know neurologists that won't even do research on it because they think boxing is, is unethical, but I, I don't think that, you know, our, our scientific feelings about it necessarily keep anyone from that profession, so I'm willing to study it. Um, years later, the, the terms have changed, uh, and uh, for example, in 1957, chronic progressive traumatic encephalopathy was coined. Uh, Dr. Omalu, the uh, topic of the upcoming concussion movie, uh, discovered the pathology in some former players, which started uh, a lot of the more recent interests. Uh, Anne McKee is a neuropathologist at Boston. Their group has been uh, really uh, uh, at the forefront of uh, uh, studying this, uh, this disease condition. Uh, and then there was recently a consensus panel uh, to establish some at least initial guidelines. Now, right now, chronic traumatic encephalopathy, or CTE, is defined only by pathology. So you really can't, it's not a real di clinical diagnosis at this point. Like, if you go to your doctor, your doctor might say you might have it, but he cannot enter a code, or she cannot enter a code that says this person has CTE and get paid for it. He's got to come up with some, something else. So it's got to be symptom-based. There are clinical diagnostic criteria being proposed, um, but they're not firmly established. And there's overlap with other disorders, so it can be difficult to, uh, to diagnose in life. A lot of the brains and the pathology uh, that's, that's been uh, studied and reported are from uh, suicide cases, some of those prominent uh, you know, uh, former uh, pro athletes and whatnot, often without a lot of details about how they were doing before this. Uh, and in research, we call these more case series rather than uh, like a, a, a carefully controlled investigation. Uh, so there's a lot we have to learn yet. Also, mood changes are not uncommon after traumatic brain injury anyway, and some may be uh, a little bit delayed onset. And of course, depression is actually one of the big risk, risk factors for suicide. And you know, just because you have depression and you happen to have had a series of concussions in your past, does that mean those things are necessarily linked? Well, what we have is a correlation here right now. So for those of you who are up on your statistics, a correlation, you'll recall, does not mean causality, right? So um, although there is a link, uh, it is suggestive, uh, there is a relationship, um, we don't know exactly how strong that is yet. So we still need to understand also uh, about the CTE pathology that we see in the brains of people maybe with only one concussion uh, or those without any diagnosed concussions. And then need to understand the overlap with other disorders because the pathology, um, some of the pathology, not all of it, is shared with other disorders uh, 
such as Alzheimer's disease and other uh, diseases associated with the, with the protein tau. So athletes are natural subjects for traumatic brain injury studies because if you, if you watch, especially contact sport athletes enough over time, they are at increased risk for sustaining concussions more than the general population. Uh, they also tend to be healthier than average, uh, fewer comorbidities in general. There are exceptions, of course. Um, I'm often asked about you know, the histories of substance abuse, steroid use, and things like that. Those things may factor in here as well, so it's, it's not straightforward. Uh, but then who do we compare them to? So you've got these, this group of elite athletes, uh, the best of the best, the upper 0.1%. You know, Who's a control group to compare them to? Do you just go out and compare them to the general population of the same age? Probably not. Uh, what about their dietary histories, their exercise histories, uh, genetic factors? It's really tough. Um, do you compare them for, do you match them on IQ, for example? In a lot of these cases, the concussions happened a long time ago, months if not years or even decades ago. So you've, you're, you're left with retrospective reporting. How many concussions have you had? Well, I had six. Well, were they all diagnosed? Well, I don't really remember. And now that I know more about concussion, actually, I probably had more like eight. I'm making that up, by the way. I haven't had that many. Um, so uh, there can be some inconsistency in reporting, although uh, we have a, a study we just completed looking at uh, reliability of concussion reporting in our retired uh, NFL players. And it looks like they're, they're pretty consistent, So uh, especially if they were knocked out. Uh, it's about a 0.8 correlation um, in terms of their ability to uh, tell you the same concussion history at two different time points, one to two years apart. Years ago, though, uh, we really weren't calling these concussions in a lot of sporting situations, right? You talk to some of the retired players, which has just been really one of the, the thrills of my career meeting some of these guys, too. Uh, they'll say, well, the coach said I had a ding. You know, I didn't remember the second half, but okay, that was a concussion, yeah. Of course, we know that now, but, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the science really wasn't up up with everything. You know, they, they talk about the NFL covering things up. There was a lot we didn't know in medicine uh, about concussions uh, years ago either. So uh, one of the studies we did, uh, we started this uh, several years ago and uh, published this uh, first paper in 2013, looking at some uh, brain imaging and cognitive function in retired uh, NFL players. And we got MRIs done on a subset of them. And we actually found a group of uh, con healthy controls that were similar in age, education, and actually IQ as well. Although, you know, body size and these other factors we just couldn't control for. So it's not a perfect study, and, and the sample is relatively small. They were in their early 60s, average college education, predominantly Caucasian. Only six were actually retired. They had played in the NFL about uh, 10 years. Uh, their range of concussions was 1 to 13. Uh, we actually now have stopped counting. If, it's more, if they tell us more than 15, we just say greater than 15, because uh, we don't know how many that is. And uh, we studied all of them with neuropsychological techniques and in brain imaging, as I mentioned. We found that uh, the majority were normal, about 60%. Uh, we did find that mild cognitive impairment, which is a, a, an abnormal state, sort of between normal aging and dementia later in life, was definitely more common in, in these guys compared to the general population, in which the frequency is about 10%. We also found a higher uh, frequency of depression. Uh, we didn't find any more dementia in our uh, sample. We did not find uh, any Lou Gehrig's disease or amyotrophic lateral sclerosis in our sample. And in our initial sample, anyway, we didn't see anybody who looked like they might have CTE. When we look at their, uh, the brain imaging, now this is comparing the uh, cognitively impaired athletes uh, to controls. And here's the front of the brain, the back of the brain. Now we're looking uh, like straight on at the brain in the middle slice. And then you see this is the right hemisphere. So as if I were turned around and the nose is up here and the back of the head is back here. These red areas are showing where these groups differ significantly. And you see it's all in the white matter. It's all in the connective tissue between the hemispheres, within the hemispheres. You see these little dots of red. Uh, we probably should use a different color because it looks like blood, but it's not blood. Uh, it's just uh, showing areas where uh, the, the tissues just were not as robust uh, in the retired uh, players in that sample. Now, when they showed cognitive impairments, uh, difficulties in, with word retrieval, uh, naming, if you will, uh, so 
Anybody over the age of 50 may have had this experience. Uh, you know, you, you know, my wife and I are watching a TV show, and oh, what's that actor's name? It's, uh, oh gosh, starts with, uh, oh, I can see, oh boy, it's, the name just evades you. You haven't forgotten it, you haven't lost it, but you can't quickly retrieve it. That's word retrieval, that's confrontation naming. That declines with normal aging, but we saw a greater decline in our, uh, in our retired players. Also, a little bit lower um, learning and memory scores as well. In addition, I mentioned the, the depression finding, which uh, many of them were surprised to know they were depressed. If you asked them if they were depressed, they said no, but then if you went through a depression symptom checklist, well, do you, have you lost pleasure in things that you used to enjoy? Well, yeah. Are you sleeping okay? No. And you go down the list of depressive symptoms, they actually qualify for a diagnosis, but weren't aware of it. So it wasn't that the typical I feel sad depression, but a lot of uh, the more physical symptoms uh, of, of depression. We did uh, diffusion tensor imaging uh, analyses, which is what I showed you a picture of, uh, showing the white matter ab abnormalities. It was only in those uh, with some evidence of cognitive uh, impairment or with depression. Uh, let's see, so I mentioned that. Uh, in terms of the, the most, symptom, most common symptoms, it was uh, reports of problems with concentration, appetite, decreased energy, sleep, and decreased uh, libido. So then we started looking at just those with depression. And we found that the guys with depression uh, and more concussions, there was a relationship. Uh, we don't understand this yet, uh, but it was a pretty robust finding. Uh, and it was uh, feelings of pessimism, indecision, guilt, et cetera, were correlated with number of uh, concussions quite significantly. And this uh, statistical relationship remained even when, when we controlled a variety of other factors. When we compare the depressed patients uh, to controls, we see even larger differences in the white matter between the groups. So those with depression look quite a bit different than those without depression. So uh, this is something we uh, really want to follow up on uh, more and, and learn more about this because uh, uh, obviously depression seems to be a bit more common uh, and it does seem to be associated with these brain changes. So what happens to memory function and memory structure uh, in aging when uh, there is a history of concussion. So for this study uh, that we just published this year, uh, we took NFL players with a history of concussion diagnosed with this disorder called mild cognitive impairment. Uh, so MCI is, a, I mentioned, it's kind of a transition period between normal aging and, and, and dementia for a lot of people, although you can, you can stay stable with the diagnosis of MCI for quite some time in some cases too, and sometimes even revert back to normal. But in general, uh, about 10% per year convert or develop additional symptoms that, that lead to dementia. Uh, it, it doesn't disrupt daily functioning, uh, typically. Uh, it'll be an isolated impairment in memory or some other cognitive skill that's a little bit of a problem, but people can still carry on their lives fairly normally uh, until it gets worse. So what we did was we compared these uh, retired NFL players with MCI to non-concussed, non-FL controls uh, with and without a diagnosis of MCI. So to kind of look at two groups of MCI, one had concussions and one didn't. And we wanted to focus on the volume, the size of the hippocampus uh, from your anatomy. Uh, you might remember the hippocampus is the like about the size of your little finger. It sits in the, in the temporal lobe on the lateral side of the brain. You've got two of them, one in each temporal lobe, unless you've had surgery to remove it or you were born without one. Um, and that's responsible for our ability to acquire and store new information. Uh, we also looked at verbal learning and memory. So like I showed you a while ago, uh, presenting a list of words for somebody to remember and asking them to recall them at a later time. What we see uh, in, in our athletes with mild cognitive impairment is that they are scoring uh, almost two standard deviations below the mean. Here's a, a mean on our verbal learning test. Uh, you see that our healthy controls without concussion are actually somewhat above average. Our athletes without MCI are right at average, although there's a range. The athletes with MCI score almost two standard deviations below the mean, and the controls with MCI, they're, st they're also impaired, but not quite as bad. So there seems to be something a little bit additive, something a little bit worse. If you get MCI and you've had a history of concussions, it looks like you're gonna do a little bit worse. Uh, this is a complicated slide. I'm not going to ask you to, to go through it, but uh, suffice to say that the, these are the uh, retired players with MCI. This is their hippocampal volume. 
the size of the hippocampus with age. These are, this is the left hippocampus. This is the right hippocampus. You can see those guys with a history of concussions in MCI have smaller hippocampal uh, uh, sizes uh, over time. And there seems to be a fairly big drop off, uh, and these lines really start converging more about at the mid-60s, where it looks like it's, it's just a greater difference between, between those groups. So if you compare that with their lower verbal memory performance, it makes sense. So the hippocampus is smaller, especially on, on the left, and they're not able to learn quite as much information uh, as a healthy sample. So to summarize some of our uh, retired uh, NFL player data, um, we saw, now that we've got a larger sample, we've seen actually close to 100 now. We have seen a couple that we think might have uh, CTE. Uh, still haven't seen any uh, Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, not really increased prevalence of dementia. It's about 6%, and that's, that's remained stable. Uh, but we do see more depression and mild cognitive impairment. So one of our conclusions is that some individuals with a history of mild traumatic brain injury or concussion are at higher risk for mood and cognitive symptoms as they age. So what about non-NFL non players? Now let's get some larger samples. These have all been pretty small, small studies. So I mentioned earlier that there is a literature linking more serious head injury with an increased uh, risk of, of Alzheimer's disease. And we wanted to follow this up by looking at a large national database uh, that all the National Alzheimer's Disease Centers uh, contribute data to the National Alzheimer's Coordinating Center. And it, it can be used by researchers uh, all over the world. And we basically selected out subjects who did and did not report a history of uh, traumatic brain injury with loss of consciousness at some point in their past. Now, the database is quite limited. It, that's all you know. You don't know when the, con when the injury occurred. Uh, you don't know how long ago, how severe it was. And if it's loss of consciousness, it could have been five minutes. It could have been three days. So we can't, it's not perfect data, uh, but it's about the best we have right now. So we wanted to find out whether uh, just having a history of, of traumatic brain injury with loss of consciousness is associated with, oops, sorry, with an earlier onset of Alzheimer's disease to replicate what's out there in the literature in this database. Um, and this database is, is unique because these are very, very carefully diagnosed individuals in this data set. They're all from the, the uh, Alzheimer's disease centers across the country. We also wanted to see if MCI uh, was diagnosed or occurred earlier. And we also looked at another type of dementia called frontotemporal dementia. That's, that's one where memory isn't the big problem. It's a, a disruption in, in personality and in, in mood. Uh, you kind of lose some of your executive functions and reasoning and problem solving ability, unlike Alzheimer's, which is more of a primarily uh, amnestic uh, disorder, at least early on. So uh, you don't have to look through all these uh, results, but suffice to say, uh, in the uh, large database that we looked at, uh, of over 8,000 cases, there were 571 that did have a history of traumatic brain injury with loss of consciousness, and we had over 7,000 that did not. And the age at diagnosis for Alzheimer's disease was 76 in those, uh, essentially those without a history of brain injury, and it was about 74 in those with a history of brain injury. So a couple year difference, it was statistically significantly different. Uh, and also, when you looked at the clinician estimated age of onset, so that would be prior to diagnosis usually. We don't often see patients right away when it's suspe suspected. Uh, you still see a similar, about a two-year difference. Um, so traumatic brain injury seems to have some, some link here. So does this apply to mild cognitive impairment? And this has been shown, our paper's under review not from this large database, um, but no one has ever looked at this in MCI until one of my graduate students, uh, Christian Labou, uh, looked at this uh, this last year. So for mild cognitive impairment, the numbers are lower. Uh, there were about 300 in the NAC database with a loss of consciousness and TBI, and almost 3,000 without. And we see a very, very similar trend here. Uh, earlier onset, age 72 versus about 75, uh, with a history of loss of consciousness with TBI. So MCI is looking kind of like Alzheimer's, a little bit earlier onset. Not a big difference, not, not necessarily a, you know, a risk factor you want to get too upset over. Uh, but if you're going to get demented, you don't want to do it. You want to do it later rather than sooner, right? So you want an extra couple good years uh, if it's going to happen. 
And then we looked at frontotemporal dementia as well. Same pattern here, a little bit uh, uh, earlier onset. Uh, uh, FTD, or frontotemporal dementia, has an earlier onset than Alzheimer's in most cases. That's why you're seeing the younger ages. So the important thing here is, is about a three-year difference. It's about a 2.8 uh, difference. So summarizing these recent studies here, uh, we see a, a, a two to three year earlier onset of some of these neurodegenerative conditions later in life when there's a history of traumatic brain injury earlier in life. So some of our uh, general conclusions, uh, I've uh, mentioned some of these before. We see memory changes when there's a history of concussion uh, with more frequency, uh, a little bit more uh, depression, depressive symptoms uh, in, a, in particular areas. We see some imaging abnormalities when there's a history of concussion. Um, it's very important that everybody's searching for biomarkers now. We want biomarkers to help us identify who has had a concussion and then who may be at risk. And we don't have them right now, but uh, there's a lot of interest in blood-based biomarkers and other uh, genetic analyses that are underway in many, many centers across the country. In terms of possible mechanisms, it's a question I always get. The answer is we don't know yet. Um, we hypothesize that the initial increase in blood flow in the regions uh, at the time of a brain injury um, may be followed by this decrease in blood flow, this energy starvation period, which may set the brain up for to kind of give it an extra risk factor for cognitive changes later in life to those who may be perhaps uh, susceptible for other reasons. Uh, and some of these reasons may be genetic. So why does person A recover in, in a day from a concussion and person B, you know, it takes them three months to recover? We don't know a lot of the answers to these things. So we need a lot more, uh, more research. Um, we need to know some of the, what are the mechanisms? What are the disorders? And who's at risk? We need to identify who's not at risk or who's at lower risk. And what factors uh, in our genetic histories or in our uh, lifestyle histories may be protective? Can we intervene and uh, cause changes in any of these things? Can we decrease risk? Is there something in midlife you can do if you've had a history of concussions that may subsequently lower your incidence or your likelihood of, of developing uh, a neurodegenerative syndrome? Obviously, as I mentioned earlier, CTE really need a lot of study for that. Um, uh, we need research, not hype. Um, I personally do not believe that everybody who gets a concussion is at risk for this disease. I, I think it's, it is a specific tauopathy uh, that, that may be linked uh, with concussion or multiple concussions, uh, but there's a lot more we need to know. Um, let's see. Future directions. I'm going to skip a couple of these. Uh, we need to be studying other uh, significantly at-risk groups at different levels, too. So what if somebody played high school sports and then stopped? Uh, are they at any increased risk, uh, depending upon what their genetic makeup might be? Following individuals over time throughout their athletic careers may be helpful as well, including uh, emotional assessment uh, and cognitive screening. Let's follow NFL players when they start in the NFL, and let's follow them after they retire as well. Comparing these groups with other populations without concussion is really, really important, but that not a lot has been done with that. For example, those brain images I showed you contrasting the patients with concussion and depression to those with, with normal brain function. We need to also look at people who just have midlife depression without concussion and see if they have the same brain imaging findings. Uh, in terms of acute situations, uh, improved detection, education about concussion, which I think is really happening a lot now. Uh, what's the best treatment? Well, right now, the big treatment for concussion is rest. Not exactly a rocket science uh, revelation. Uh, but how much rest and for whom? Uh, if you take somebody out of school, out of their normal routine for too long, that may actually have... Uh, uh, effects that uh, result in more symptoms than if you get them back to their normal schedule more quickly. A couple days rest, okay. Pulling somebody out of school for you know a, a year or two years after a, an uncomplicated concussion may be overdoing it. Um, some individuals become highly sensitive or sensitized to the to the concussion. So, for example, if I go skiing and I had a knee injury back in high school, and now my knee starts hurting now that I'm in my 50s, I'm thinking, oh, it's that it's that old injury. Might just be because I have a 50 plus year old leg, right? So, but that attribution may, may make sense and, and that may be happening in some of this sort of uh, ongoing symptoms that we see. 
Uh, I mentioned education is critical. All states are requiring it now. Uh, reporting, uh, the kids need to be reporting, the athletes need to be reporting. They need to be asking each other, are you, hey, are you really okay? Uh, talk about uh, rules and their enforcement, legislation. And of course, not la you know, last but not least is, is equipment changes. But we have to be careful. There's probably never gonna be a concussion-proof helmet uh, because the brain is still gonna rattle around in the skull. I'm not saying we can't do better than we are. In fact, uh, making sure you, that you've got uh, up, you know, state-of-the-art equipment is actually quite important. Um, and I think I'll end there and leave some time for questions. <laughs>